Today, we're gonna to talk about calcium metabolism from an endocrinologist's perspective. Let's start with some revision of calcium homeostasis and bone physiology. Serum calcium levels are tightly regulated on a moment-to-moment -moment basis by the actions of vitamin D and parathyroid hormone. The amount of calcium that is albumin bound can be affected by hydration and nutritional status. When the albumin levels decrease, the total serum calcium levels may appear low, and this is known as pseudo-hypocalcemia. When the albumin levels increase, total serum calcium levels will appear elevated, and this is known as pseudo-hypercalcemia. In both cases, by checking an ionized calcium level, you will gain, you will see a normal a level indicating that there are normal circulating free levels of calcium. The causes of pseudo-hypercalcemia include conditions that increase protein states within the body, multiple myeloma where there is an elevation of monoclonal immunoglobulins, hyperalbuminemia for nu from numerous causes, v Waldenstrom's macroglobulinemia, which is a hematologic disorder, and thrombocytosis where there is an elevation of platelets. The sources of vitamin D, which is a fat-soluble vitamin, include de novo production in the skin from sunlight, in the food that we eat, and also from taking vitamin supplements. There are two forms of vitamin D supplementation, vitamin D2, also known as ergocalciferol, which has a longer half-life, and vitamin D3, or cholecalciferol, which has tighter bonding to vitamin D receptors. It also has a greater potency than vitamin D2. It's also identical to the vitamin D that naturally occurs in humans after ultraviolet light exposure. Vitamin D3 and D2 must be hydroxylated twice before becoming active. The first occurs in the liver and converts vitamin D to 25-hydroxy vitamin D, otherwise known as calcidiol. The second occurs primarily in the kidney and forms the physiologically active 125-dihydroxy vitamin D, otherwise known as calcitriol. Because 25-hydroxy vitamin D has a relatively long half-life of several weeks, it is the best indicator of the whole body stores of vitamin D. Active vitamin D acts on three organ systems to achieve and maintain normal serum calcium. Bone, intestine, and kidney. PTH is secreted to increase the calcium in the blood in response to even the slightest degree of hypocalcemia. PTH acts on the kidney to increase production of active vitamin D to promote calcium resorption in the distal convoluted tubule and the loop of Henle. PTH acts on bone to activate calcium and release it into the bloodstream. The clinical features of hypercalcemia occur when serum calcium levels are above the normal range, usually greater than 10.5 milligrams per deciliter. Most patients are asymptomatic, and hypercalcemia may be noted incidentally on lab tests obtained for other reasons. Symptoms may occur with any degree of hypercalcemia, but they are much more common when calcium levels exceed 12 milligrams per deciliter. There is a really good way to remember the clinical findings and symptoms that occur in hypercalcemia. Stones refers to calcium levels being elevated, causing kidney stones. Abdominal groans are a, a feature of hypercalcemia in that patients tend to present with nonspecific abdominal pain. Bones are a reminder that because of act ele elevated levels of PTH, the bones are the primary source of calcium breakdown that enters into the bloodstream to cause hypercalcemia. And finally, the presence of elevated calcium as it increases causes mood disturbances and ultimately other central nervous system effects. The classic symptoms are usually based on the severity of calcium rise. So starting at a calcium level of around 11 milligrams per deciliter, one notices the classical features of polyuria, polydipsia, nocturia, which is increased urination at night, and the presence of kidney stones. As the calcium levels increase above 11, patients may manifest anorexia, nausea, abdominal pain, constipation, 
There may also be effects on the kidneys. The creatinine may rise because elevations of calcium cause what we know as a calciuresis or an increased diuresis of water that the body loses causing a pre-renal state and hence a rise in creatinine levels. This can also be followed with some mild mental status changes. And then finally, as the calcium increases above 12, patients pr present with profound mental status changes. They may be obtunded, and kidney injury due to profound dehydration may be a manifestation. One will also note an increasing creatinine level at this stage. The causes of hypercalcemia can be divided into parathyroid-mediated and non-parathyroid-mediated. Parathyroid-mediated causes are typically those caused by elevations in parathyroid hormone. Primary hyperparathyroidism, usually caused by an adenoma or increased hyperplasia of the parathyroid gland, is the most common cause. Parathyroid cancers, although very, very rare, may cause it. And tertiary hyperparathyroidism, which is a rare condition that occurs in patients with chronic kidney failure. And then finally, the even rarer familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, which we'll, we'll, we'll discuss later. Moving on to non-parathyroid-mediated causes of hypercalcemia, hypercalcemia of malignancy, otherwise known as humoral hypercalcemia, is a condition where an abnormal parathyroid hormone is secreted, causing elevations of calcium, and uh, usually from bone sources, that are related to tumors. This is usually a paraneoplastic manifestation. Another malignant manifestation of hypercalcemia are those tumors that metastasize to bone and cause bone destruction. These can cause calcium release into the bloodstream and are mainly because of osteolysis of bone. Another common cause of non-parathyroid-mediated hypercalcemia is vitamin D toxicity. These are individuals who take excessive levels of vitamin D, causing increased calcium absorption and hypercalcemia. It is also seen, but to a rarer degree, with high levels of vitamin A. Granulomatous diseases like sarcoidosis and TB also cause hypercalcemia, but these are usually mediated through vi vitamin D mechanisms that we'll talk about later. Rarer conditions like milk alkali syndrome, thyrotoxicosis, and prolonged immobilization can also cause elevations of serum calcium.